Okay, welcome to the last video in our chemical bonding section. We're going to talk about intermolecular forces. I referenced this in the second video of this series where we talked about the uh, properties of the types of bonds. We covered uh, melting point and solubility and conductivity. And I used the term weaker forces and then I told you I would get back to those later. Well, this is it. When I'm talking about those forces, we're talking about intermolecular forces. And let's break that down. Inter means between. Okay, and molecular is obviously referring to molecules. Okay, so intermolecular forces must be forces between molecules. Okay, so that's two different molecules that have some kind of force between them. Either there's a force of attraction or a repulsive force. In this case, we're going to be talking about forces of attraction. Okay, um, remember that bonds are forces of attraction between atoms and intermolecular forces are forces of attraction between molecules. So there is a difference there. Okay, bonds are always stronger than intermolecular forces. Okay, so that means down here intermolecular forces are always weaker than bonds. Okay, bonds are stronger. Um, the strength of uh, the intermolecular forces between molecules has a lot to do with the boiling and freezing points, um, the melting points, um, the solubility, and the conductivity. All of that is based off of the strength of these intermolecular forces. There are different types of intermolecular forces, and they appear in different types of molecules. Okay, so if you have covalently bonded molecules, then you're going to see London dispersion forces. Okay, these will pop up if you have a nonpolar covalent molecule. Okay, so London forces, they're also called Van der Waals forces or London dispersion forces. So, like three names there. And they show up anytime you have a nonpolar covalent molecule uh, getting near another nonpolar covalent molecule. They are the weakest of the intermolecular forces unless there's a really long chain of the nonpolar molecules. And in that case, they kind of add together. The forces keep adding and keep adding. It's like um, tug of war. Maybe it's you versus. Uh, one elementary school kid okay obviously the elementary school kid is weaker than you are but now let's say I put 9,000 elementary school kids against you they're gonna be stronger than you are okay so the more of them there are the stronger they get because they have this additive effect the next type of intermolecular force that we could see is called a dipole dipole force Okay, di means two, and pole, remember, in science is the separation of something. So we have a separation of charge between the two different molecules. This will show up in polar covalent molecules. Okay, they are the second strongest, or the middle, you could say, of the intermolecular forces. Okay, um, they show up whenever hydrogen is not bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Okay, so if hydrogen is bonded to something besides nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, then you end up with this dipole dipole um, intermolecular force. Okay, so it's going to act like um, a magnet, that's what makes it a little bit stronger, and so it's the, the middle, the second. All right, so down here we have an example of that. We've got hydrochloric acid right here. So this is a polar bond because uh, chlorine is really electronegative and hydrogen isn't. So the chlorine is going to be a partially negative charge and the hydrogen is going to be a partially positive charge. So that makes this um, a polar bond. Now, the requirement is that hydrogen is not bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. 
and you'll see here that it isn't. It's bonded to chlorine. So in between these molecules, it, it, the dipole, dipole force of attraction is not in here. This is a bond. This is stronger than an intermolecular force. An intermolecular force is between molecules. So here's one molecule and here's another molecule. So the intermolecular force is between. And, and I got this picture off the internet and intermolecular forces are not usually drawn with a solid line. They're drawn with a dotted line. So let me replace that for you. And um, so here we've got the partial positive on the hydrogen from this molecule. And let me just write in that this chlorine is partially negative. So we have two polar bonds, okay, polar covalent, and we have a dipole-dipole um, force of attraction between this molecule and this molecule. Okay, so the positive end of this molecule is attracted to the negative end of this molecule, just like magnets, all right? Whenever you draw a dipole uh, force of attraction, you usually draw an arrow, and you cross the arrow so that a little plus sign appears on the positive side, and you're pointing towards the negative side, okay? And so we've drawn a dipole moment. That's what that's called. And anyways, all you really need to know is that we have a polar uh, covalent molecule here and a polar covalent molecule here. And so there's going to be a dipole-dipole intermolecular force of attraction between them from positive end to negative end of each of the molecules. Okay, the next and last kind of intermolecular force is called hydrogen bonding. Okay, this occurs in polar covalent molecules, um, the hydrogen has to be bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine in order for hydrogen bonding to happen. And this is the strongest of the intermolecular forces. Okay, So uh, one really good example here is going to be a water molecule. Okay, We have um, a polar covalent bond here and here, and hydrogen is bonded to oxygen right there, which fills that requirement. So the oxygen is going to be a partially negative charge. Okay. Each of the hydrogens are partially positive, so I'm just going to go through and fill that in for you guys real quick. And so we have here our hydrogen bonding. I, I, I've always hated this. This is called hydrogen bond in biology. Um, when you're talking about uh, DNA and you have hydrogen bonds, what they're really talking about is this intermolecular force. And there's a difference. Remember, bonds are always stronger than intermolecular forces. And so the name of this intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. It is not a bond. All right, so this is actually incorrect here. There's really no such thing as a hydrogen bond. It's hydrogen bonding, and it's an intermolecular force. So I've redone it as a dotted line here uh, to show that it's an intermolecular force and not a bond. But the um, positive end of this water molecule is attracted to the negative end of this water molecule. And we could put a whole bunch of more water molecules all along a page and show them all being um, attracted towards each other's positive and negative end. Uh, that's what allows water to uh, have its, its large surface tension. Um, there's an animal called the Jesus Christ lizard that can run on top of water because it's got such a strong surface tension. The basilisk is called the Jesus Christ lizard because it can walk, well, really run on water. It bicycles its hind legs and the tail becomes a counterweight. And the reason for that is because of these intermolecular forces, the hydrogen bonding intermolecular force being the strongest of them, that means that these water molecules want to stay really, really close together, and that allows them to have this large surface tension. It's also responsible for creating the meniscus inside of your, your graduated cylinder. When we do that in lab, and we, we are going to read 
the liquid or whatever. The reason that it makes that shape is because the water molecules are really strongly attracted to the glass and it's that it, those intermolecular forces there's a force of attraction between the water and the glass that it's sitting in and so these water mo molecules actually kind of climb over the top of each other to get up towards the glass and that makes this curvy shape here um, so these intermolecular forces are actually responsible for a lot of of things and hydrogen bonding is one of the most important ones because as I've mentioned we see it in DNA okay so just as a little refresher here we've got um, a little section of DNA so here's the deoxyribose there's the phosphate groups and that makes up the backbone that lines both the sides here and then here we've got an adenine and we've got a thymine so remember A to T and then here we've got a cytosine and here we've got a guanine C to G remember there are two hydrogen bonds between A's and T's and three hydrogen bonds between C's and G's. Now remember, it's not really a hydrogen bond, it's hydrogen bonding because it's an intermolecular force. All right, let's zoom in a little bit and uh, examine both of these. So remember, the requirement for hydrogen bonding is that it be a polar covalent bond and that hydrogen has to be bonded to uh, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So right here we have a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, and that's a polar covalent bond. And then here is an oxygen, so hydrogen is going to be attracted to that as well. So that's why there's hydrogen bonding occurring right there. Same thing here. Hydrogen's bonded to a nitrogen, and it's going to be attracted to this nitrogen over here as well. So hydrogen bonding occurs. Okay. And then if we look at the cytosine and the guanine, you'll notice the same thing. Hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, and then over here is another oxygen, so it's going to be attracted to that oxygen. Same situation here, except it's attracted to nitrogen, and the same situation here, and it's attracted to an oxygen. So on these molecules, the reason that they have the number of hydrogen bonds that they do is because of how many times hydrogen is bonded to this and the fact that these molecules perfectly match up. And isn't, that's so cool that nature has created these molecules so that they end up having these three spots on this molecule and three spots on this molecule that perfectly match up to create that hydrogen bond, which allows our DNA strands to actually stick together. That's amazing. This, because that happened, we can exist. That's amazing. Here's a picture of multiple water molecules and they're all exhibiting hydrogen bonding all throughout. So they've kind of created this whole network. So anytime you pour a glass of water or it rains and you have a puddle, the reason that that puddle is all grouped together is because of this hydrogen bonding. I mean, if we didn't have this hydrogen bonding, then that means every time that it rained, every individual of molecule of water would hit the pavement and then they would all scatter and start rolling around all over the place like a bunch of, uh, you know, ping pong balls or something. But they don't. They all group together in this, in a puddle or something or in water droplets because of this hydrogen bonding here. Okay, quick little recap. We had three types of bonds. We had covalent, ionic, and metallic. And covalent actually broke down into two different subgroups, which were the polar covalent and the nonpolar covalent. And we had three types of intermolecular forces. We had hydrogen bonding, which is the strongest. We have dipole-dipole, which is the second strongest. And then you had London dispersion or van der Waal or sometimes just London. And they are the very weakest. Okay. Here's kind of a picture again of each of these types of bonds happening where we've got um, a nonpolar covalent bond where they share the electrons equally. We have polar covalent bonds where they share them unequally. So the oxygen in this water molecule gets the electrons for most of the time. We have ionic bonds where we completely transfer an electron from one element to another. And then we have this hydrogen bonding occurring right here which again is an intermolecular force and not a bond at all and so between this molecule and this molecule we have that 
hydrogen bonding occurring. Okay, I think we can leave it there for today. That is the end of our uh, chemical bonding series. I hope that you've learned something. If you have any questions, please see me for tutorials. Um, thank you for learning with me. Bye.